And now that uh, they kind of are required to provide goods and, you know, manufacture things for their own people and, uh, well, probably for, you know, the needs of the Ukrainian front, they won't be able to sustain this. They won't be able to jumpstart this because you can't, you know, jumpstart manufacturing en masse, you know, in, in a matter of one month or two months or whatever. No. What are they going to do? And plus, with no energy or not enough energy to run all of this, I don't know what are they going to do. They don't have the capacity to, uh, to go for it. And therein lies the problem because uh, they will be pressed and they will be pressed by their own people because it is not a very quiet and peaceful situation in the European countries. People are revolting. And uh, here we go again. Welcome to Redneck TV with Kat. And Scott. Today we're doing episode number 40. Can you believe it? Seems like we just started this too. Yeah. And I guess it's been a while now. We started back in March when we are burning bonfires. Yeah, that's right. In the backyard. Yeah. We're in a different part of the backyard today. Yeah. Uh, it's still the big, like there's big outdoors and this is the big backyard. Pretty good size. Really. Yeah, it's quite the hell of a backyard. <laughs> no, I like it. So, um, what are we going to talk about? Well, the topic of the day. Um, I got up this morning, I, you know, it was a day off for me, so I slept in a little bit and got some coffee and started working on music. And got done what I wanted to get done, and I pick up my phone, and of course I want to check the telegram and see what's going on in the world. And, what, uh, Kat sent you something? Kat sent me something, but so oh. did her brother Alan from oh. Moscow. Yeah. Um, I get a short message from Alan who said, Hi Scott, it appears that Russia is mobilizing. And I'm like, okay. oh boy. Uh, we've seen hints of this coming in the last couple of weeks. Um, and then Kat sent me a post also from a gentleman named Podubny. Yes, Thank that's you. correct, Evgeny Podubny. He's yeah. a w Russian war correspondent. Um, I don't remember from what channel. We've been watching him uh, do a lot of videos on Telegram, though. He's a very good correspondent. He has yeah. a lot of military knowledge, yeah. um, especially in Ukraine. And I guess he was in Syria and did some other correspondent work for uh, yeah. some of the other Russian conflicts over the years. But he's a very knowledgeable man, and he's... Uh, He's good at what he does, uh, let's put yeah. it that way. Um, before we get too far into it though, you may notice we're wearing our Mana.co t-shirts today. Yeah. So I got a friend, Miguel, I met him on Instagram. Uh, he's uh, from Allentown, Pennsylvania, a fellow musician and a fellow small business owner. So yeah. we, we want to give him a shout out. He uh, took interest in our Southern Caracal brand, which we'll put our little logo up here for you. We sell all natural skincare products. But today we're going to shout out Manico, and it's a small business that specializes in casual sportswear. Very high quality gear. I want you to check them out. My buddy Miguel, you can find them on Instagram at Manicompany2022 or Manico.squarespace.com and we'll put up those uh, links for you here. Yes, and in the description, certainly. High quality gear, very comfortable to wear. We did a little exchange. Uh, we sent him some of our Southern Caracal products, and Miguel sent us back in reciprocation these very fine t-shirts. Yeah. And check them out, get yourself a shirt, support a local small business, made in America. Fully made in America. Yeah. And if you have a brand of your own, get a hold of us. Maybe we can arrange a similar kind of deal. We want to see more of this going on in the United States. Small businesses working together to defeat the big box stores. It's never going to happen, but we can at least support each other and make a dent. Oh, maybe at some point it will happen. That's so I, I what we're lose, hoping for. I wouldn't lose hope. So let's help each other. Reach out to us if you have a small business um, and maybe we can forge some sort of deal and help each other. 
We'll Let's definitely give you a shout out here on Redneck TV with Cat and Scott too. Yes, absolutely. All right, well, let's get into this. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, a little bit of background here from Mr. D uh, Padubny. Padubny, thank you. Yeah. I'm terrible with his name. I can't seem to remember it. But It's okay. It starts off calmly and without emotions about the events of today. After the entry of new subjects into the Russian Federation, we will no longer liberate the lands of Donbass but the territory of Russia occupied by Ukrainian troops. And this means that Moscow has new tools for conducting military operations. Yep. What this means, folks, is Russia's going to take it up a couple notches. Yep. First of all, you can declare martial law. Still, after the ratification of the decision to join the LDNR, Kherson region and Zaporizhia, a significant amount of our territories will remain near Kiev. And here there can no longer be any double think. In order to free them, the authorities may change the term CBO to something more legal. It is no coincidence that on Tuesday the State Duma introduced the concepts of martial law and wartime into the criminal code, and after them the term mobilization. Yep, only stands to reason. This does not mean that right tomorrow, according to the Ukrainian scenario, raids will begin in nightclubs, taverns on the street, and in public transportation. It is unlikely that this process will become endemic. Most likely, no one will take untrained youths who have not completed military service to the war. The authorities have the opportunity to carry out, for example, partial mobilization, which may be limited to the call-up of reserve officers people who have completed their military service in the last three to five years, as well as foreigners. I do not see anything shameful in attracting the latter. Yeah. If Ukraine does not disdain mercenaries from all over the world, then why should we deny ourselves the opportunity to put visitors into the ranks if they express a corresponding desire? And we know this to be the case in Ukraine. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, I've I've been just sharing with you. Remember those uh, GoPro footage of you know someone's first uh, trip to Ukraine, and there yeah. was a first-person view of well, not really the action there, but like being there on the front line. So it was, uh, I guess, um, our own American. He was an American for sure. An American, yeah. yeah. In the first video that I watched from that same channel, that was his first time. Uh, first deployment, uh, there was a the French guy there and another American um, guy who seemed to be very young uh, and without any military experience prior to that. So we know that that is going on. So, I, I mean, objectively, regardless of, you know, whatever you think of Putin or Zelensky, it doesn't matter. Like, if one side is um, employing mercenaries, right uh why should the other side be shamed for doing exactly the same what's wrong with this there's nothing wrong with I don't it. See anything um, wrong with it ukraine just had a big counteroffensive here over the last couple of weeks if you've been following any of this you've probably heard about they've taken back quite a bit of territory yeah um it's my understanding that this was not led by actual ukrainian military but by those that were trained from other agencies outside of ukraine um, NATO, perhaps. My understanding is that the kind of units that were deployed uh, on the Kharkov direction um, in that uh, and were engaged in that offensive were some of Ukraine's finest units, and that includes um, infantry units and armor. Um, and those units were predominantly trained for months since the very beginning of the um, of the war in Ukraine were trained by British specialists, our own specialists, and uh, NATO uh, military NATO advisors. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah NATO military advisors. Yeah. Yeah. It's my understanding as well. At the same time, responsibility for their actions during hostilities also increases. The deputies propose to consolidate such articles as looting up to 15 years in prison and voluntary surrender from 3 to 10. Of course, if our fighters get to the enemy in battle, no one will judge for this. The punishment for the unauthorized abandonment of a unit during the period of mobilization and martial law up to 10 years in a colony 
as well as for failure to comply with the order of the commander, up to three years, is being tightened. These measures are dictated by cases when military personnel who are counted on leave their positions. During the CBO, they even received the nickname 500. I'm not sure I know it. The 500s. Well, they have, uh, look, do you remember I told you about uh, freight, uh, freight 200? Oh, freight yes. Freight 200 means, yes, yes, yes. means dead. Uh, dead, deceased, killed in action. That's freight 200. Freight 300 is uh, wounded. Okay. The wounded. And freight 500, I guess, is... deserters. Is deserters, yeah. Right. I don't know if there's what... There's probably a 400, and I don't know what that stands for. That's interesting. Thanks for that information. Uh, that's something most people wouldn't know. The, retality, uh, the realities of war... The realities of war can be difficult to get used to. I myself witnessed when the volunteers who arrived at the front after the very first breaks near the trenches were filmed and amicably left to their positions. And legally, there is nothing to reproach those who do not want to fight. After all, the special military operation is not spelled out in the law. This means that refusers should not bear responsibility. In the event of a declaration of martial law, this loophole disappears. There's nowhere to retreat. The enemy is already on the territory of Russia. Yeah. The referendum is a legal formality. But this formality, on the one hand, is of strategic importance, untying hands in the use of forces and means. According to our military doctrine, we even have the right to use nuclear weapons in the event of a threat to the sovereignty of the Russian Federation. On the other hand, it has a purely therapeutic effect. After the fail in the Kharkiv region, it is important for us to make it clear to people we will not leave anyone else, and no one will take our territories away from us anymore. In the end, we have recently, and the Constitution spelled out a ban on the alienation of land. It just won't happen right away, of course. We are in for very difficult times, but the measures taken will bring our common victory closer. And that's what it is. We're making now the distinction between what Mr. Putin has called all along a special military operation yeah. and the declaration of war. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that, that was kind of my understanding from the get-go that uh, because mm, formally uh, Russian troops were not fighting on the territory of uh, Russian Federation, right? But you know, in a neighboring region, uh, it could not be declared a war. Uh, it was called just that, and perhaps that explains why certain mechanisms, certain legal mechanisms, could not be engaged, like um, you know, a certain level of mobilization, because under Russian law, I guess that that would have been illegal. But if those uh, should those territories join the Russian Federation and become um, become its um, what is it called its subject? In that event, um, the all of this um, all of this gets a uh, different context, a different legal context. Right. 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 So what is going on here? Um, we have referendums now in Luhansk, Donetsk, Kherson, yeah. Zaporizhia districts to join the Russian Federation. Yep. Now, if you're looking at CNN or some of the mainstream media here in the United States, you're going to see the word annexation. Yeah. And if you look up the word annexation, just do a simple search on Google. Annexation in international law is the forcible acquisition of one state territory by another state, usually following military occupation of the territory. Yeah. So, of course, the... Um, Remember, the important word here is forcible. Yeah. So, of course, the uh, Western liberal legacy media is going to portray all of this as annexation. 
uh, because the I've word seen it in every post that you yes. look at this up on Google. Just Google it up. You want to? Um, Putin was supposed to give a speech today, Mr. Putin, President Putin of Russia. It got postponed. I went looking to see if I could find a speech anywhere before we knew it had gotten postponed till tomorrow. But everywhere you look, you see Russian annexation of Donbass and Ukraine territories. Yeah, well, and I, th I think this is uh, this is just uh, this just exemplifies the levels of propaganda yeah. in the West uh, and the gross distortion of the realities on the ground. Because um, I I don't think this whole matter of Russia Ukraine is black and white. It is portrayed as black and white, but it is not. Um, I think that um, I think that of course, as I, as I told you before, I think that of course uh, Kremlin plays a hand in uh, these territories. Of course, they do provide certain aid. Of course, they are there. Of course, it is an area of their interest. But at the same time. I don't think that, you know, I can't rule out that the majority of the people on these territories indeed might be very willing to join the Russian Federation for their own reasons. I mean, one factor does not exclude the other one. Right. So um, this depiction of, this, of these events as of annexation, I think that's just pure propaganda and it doesn't give the uh, proper insights into the situation. Another definition I want to throw out is the term referendum. Okay. All right. Do, we, do you know what a referendum is? Uh, my understanding is that a referendum is basically a, um, some sort of question that is carried out on a national level uh, via popular, popular vote. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, it's a direct vote by the electorate on a proposal, law, or political issue. Okay. Which is not congruent with annexation. No, it's not. If the people of Donetsk vote to join the Russian Federation, yeah. then it's done by popularity of the winning vote. Yeah. Nothing says they have to join it. Putin's not saying you guys have to join the Russian Federation because you live in this, yeah. this region. Yeah. They're going to vote on it. Yep. This is not in Russia. They're not in Russia yet, so Putin doesn't really have any control over it. No, he doesn't. Okay. He doesn't have any legal um, legal weight or... Yeah. He doesn't have any legal power over these territories. In that regard, I want to bring up a post from Denis Pushilin, who is the head of the... Um, Donetsk People's Republic. Okay. All right. Mr. Pushilin turned to Putin with a request to consider the issue of the DPR joining the Russian Federation in the event of a positive decision of the inhabitants in a referendum. All right. So he's saying if the people in the Republic of Donetsk vote that they want to join the Russian Federation, yeah. this is what I'd like to see happen. All right. Yeah. Dear Vladimir Vladimirovich. In the event of a positive decision following the referendum, which we have no doubts about, I ask you to consider the issue of the Donetsk People's Republic joining the Russian Federation as soon as possible. The long-suffering people of Donbass deserved to be part of the great country, which they always considered their motherland. This event will be the restoration of historical justice, the onset of which millions of Russian people crave. Well, I mean, my, my stance on all of this is that, uh, you know, because of my populist stance on a lot of things, uh, if people vote for something, if they want to join Russia, uh, if that's what they truly want, so be it, you know? I mean, we can rehash the last six months of the war at infinitum, but um, we did do a few episodes here, six, seven, and eight. You can go back and check them out on my timeline here yeah. on my channel. And by the way, if you like the content you're seeing here, please watch some of these older videos. You're going to learn a lot of stuff. We, we, yeah. we dive in and do a lot of research. We've been called uh, biased, low-quality content by well, a commenter on my last video. But, yeah. But we try not to be. 
by a store low quality. So it turns out I'm Armenian. Uh, that's right. And Kat was accused of being Armenian, which she said, which thank I you. take as a compliment. We, yeah. we got called Armenian sympathizers for our last video. Yeah, I take that as a compliment. I, yeah, I'm okay with that too. But if you like our content, there's a little bell over here. I want you to ring the bell, subscribe to my channel and you'll get notified of all our videos here. You can hit the like button over there and please share our content out to your friends. We'd really appreciate that. Yep. So what do you think the consequences could be in regards to Russia mobilizing and declaring martial law for the United States or for the NATO countries? Well, generally speaking, with uh, the wealth of knowledge that we possess now, knowing about the depletion of uh, resources in uh, the NATO countries, right, including us, uh, knowing that NATO countries are not able to supply that much, that much munitions and armor and, you know, other, other equipment to the Ukrainian side, I think that is going to spell trouble for, generally speaking, Western countries. You know, countries who are right now pouring all of this aid uh, into Ukraine, I don't think is going to pan out very well, because I suspect that Russia is going to just tighten its ranks, uh, and they still did not mobilize. They're just going to do it, and I don't think that they would need to uh, roll out a full mobilization. Like uh, Padubny said there in that post, I yeah. think what it might boil, boil down to, they will probably mobilize people, uh, the reserves, right? The professional reserves, which means officers, right. Right? right? And also perhaps people who did serve in the past three to five three years, to five years it said, because right. they would be uh, more accustomed to the you know modern warfare and modern right. uh, tech and equipment. You know, it wouldn't it would wouldn't make any sense to mobilize people who served ten years ago, because probably they're kind of way too rusty on that. That that would be just a waste of human resource. More than that, I also believe that Russia, um, all of these sanctions and all of these actions by NATO countries against uh, Russia by means of Ukraine using Zelensky's regime as their, their puppet and their front in this uh, conflict, I think what it does is it pushes Russia further towards, you know, closer to China and India, these two countries. So I would not be surprised if in, under the current circumstances, what might happen is that Russia might all of a sudden start getting some Chinese military aid in the form of maybe uh, equipment, uh, Russia is already getting uh, support from Iran. Uh, it well, might especially start... in the form of drones. Yes. Unarmed, um, um, unmanned aerial yeah. vehicles. I won't be UAVs. surprised if Russia starts yeah. to get the support, the needed support, as far as not financially, but probably in terms of equipment. I don't know about manpower, but equipment definitely, and probably some economic support from China. That might happen. And that also might happen, because right now the situation between us and China is exacerbated by the actions of the White House resident, um, who yeah, it seems uh, is pretty dumb when it comes to foreign policy. <laughs> well, so because of because of what he's doing and what he's saying, it leads to um, kind of a souring uh, relationship well, with China, which is very inconvenient well, for the apparently West. Apparently, he has right said now. that we would back in a military conflict. We would back Taiwan, which of course upsets China. And he hasn't said this just once, but he said it apparently four times now, according to Tim Pool. Yeah, you, uh -huh. you know what, my, I, again, what I think is that, um, you know, I personally, yes, okay, I stand with Taiwan, I would, I would want, I don't stand with the Chinese Communist Party, I don't like communists. Right. But I do understand, if I was a political leader, if I was the leader of a country, I would have to very carefully pick my words. Yeah. Because certain escalations and certain directions of foreign policy would be just a little bit too much. Like, we're already involved with Ukraine. Right. We're involved uh, in uh, Central Asia, in the Middle East. Yeah. We're involved all over the place. Um, meanwhile, this administration is emptying our oil reserves, so we're looking down a 
barrel of a gun uh, looking into a energy crisis potentially the lowest it's been in what 40 years yes. i believe we're facing uh economic problems inflation uh supply chain disruptions right uh, and not not just us by and large western countries who are engaging in all of this the right? nato countries um are having very difficult financial times and it's going to get worse moving into the winter season yeah um they're very dependent on russia for energy yes and if there's a martial law enacted and mobilization in russia that's going to shut off the valves in going into europe and the nato countries yes all right you already have poor economies you have countries like Serbia, for example, sending over Soviet-era T-72 tanks into Ukraine, yeah. thinking that Poland is going to jump in and give them some new tanks. And Poland is not going to do that. Poland's not going to do that. They can't. No, they can't. Their economy's hurt, too. Well, because Poland is propped up, let's, let's face it, Poland is kind of a, like, a favorite uh, currently in the post-Soviet era, is kind of a... Um, favorite country for um, Western for Western powers they pamper Poland a lot they poured in a lot of money and a lot of military equipment into specifically into Poland which leads me to believe that once Ukraine crumbles once Ukraine is drained which is inevitable because it's unsustainable um, Poland might step in did you hear about Poland already making demands of Germany to pay reparations, reparations for World yes. War II? Yeah, yes. I heard about that a couple days ago. I will not be surprised yeah. if, with all the weapons and all the money that was being that has been poured into Poland specifically, of all countries in Europe, Poland, not Germany, Poland. If Poland at some point, once Ukraine is weakened, if Poland steps in and says, you know what, Ukraine. Those uh, northwestern territories, Galicia and uh, what was the other one? I don't remember. Um, yeah, kind of historically, they rather belong to us. And by the way, we yeah. were supplying you tanks. Do you remember? And uh, you know, yeah. this and that and mortars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So how about you? you no, know, kind of maybe let's figure this matter out, or else. Zelensky is already, uh, my understanding is that he already was negotiating with uh, NATO leaders. Uh, about, um, you know, in exchange for more military aid and more money uh, providing uh, Ukrainian territories for NATO military bases. Right. So Zelensky is already right. selling out his country, his territories and his resources. I don't know, God only knows what else is he negotiating, right? Right. Um, so that is already happening. So I will not be surprised if Poland at some point steps in and says, hey, hey, that's historically ours. We're going to take that. And that is going to be your thank you to us for our military aid right now. That might very, very well happen. But anyways, returning to your initial question, which was... How will the mobilization and martial law enactment from Russia uh, affect the U.S. and NATO countries? Yes. So my... I went off on a long explanation. Yes, you did, but it was, it was very good. Thank you. <laughs> But uh, it, I think it will all boil down to that Russia potentially right now has more resources uh, to double down. Whereas uh, Western countries, NATO countries that are backing up uh, Ukraine and Zelen well, Zelensky's regime, they can't, they appear to not be able to uh, double down on any action. What are they going to do? Supply more HIMARS. We are running out of, of HIMARS ammunition. And I have an article about that we're going to get to. I, I, that's what I wanted to tie in next. Thanks for that good lead-in to the next story. Mm -hmm. um, European economies and the United States economy are not doing very well currently. Yeah. Um, these countries, as it gets into winter, will be facing even more difficulties with uh, Russia mobilizing and declaring martial law, they will not yeah. be getting the resources they need as far as energy, then they do not have the independence, like you just said, to bolster their own economies. Well, another factor in all of this is that uh, European countries were shooting themselves in both legs and every, everywhere else, in other tender places, uh, for roughly two, three decades 
because they were outsourcing their manufacturing to China, weren't they? Right. And they were growing right. increasingly dependent on Russian energy, also fertilizer, uh, grain, etc., etc. So they became basically European countries have become uh, like you know tourist attractions of sorts, countries that don't run their own economies themselves. They've outsourced everything. And now that uh, they kind of are required to provide goods and, you know, manufacture things for their own people and, uh, well, probably for, you know, the needs of the Ukrainian front, they won't be able to sustain this. They won't be able to jumpstart this because you can't, you know, jumpstart manufacturing en masse, you know, in, in a matter of one month or two months or whatever. No. What are they going to do? And plus, with no energy or not enough energy to run all of this, I don't know what are they going to do. They don't have the capacity to uh, to go for it. And therein lies the problem because uh, they will be pressed and they will be pressed by their own people because it is not a very quiet and peaceful situation in the European countries. People are revolting. What have you heard about China reacting to the talk of Mr. Biden about the uh, military support for Taiwan as far as sanctions against the United States. Uh, that part I did not hear. What is what is there? I've, I've only heard a little bit about this. This is just happening now today. So I'll have to do some more research on that. We can probably talk about it in another episode. But yeah. that's a serious concern also. What happens if China stops backing the United States and stops doing all the manufacturing yeah. that we require. If they just basically say, you know what, no, we're not going to be making that those and those parts for you anymore. We're right. not going to be manufacturing that Pharmaceuticals, and that um, yes. protective gear for, well, we don't have to worry about the pandemic any longer either. Yeah. That's over now. But how many people yeah. in this country in America depend on this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the American... The, the, the American people haven't been very healthy for a while. Yeah. So a lot of people, because of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, depend on all sorts of meds. And the manufacturing of those meds, even the essential ones, has been outsourced to China and India for a while now. And that's just one aspect of it. How many other uh, products are not made here anymore? Even in with our own state, right? Right. Let's talk about the manufacture of artillery shells for a moment. Yeah. In the United States. I have an article from the Eurasian Times here. This is dated September 18th, so a couple days ago. Uh -huh. um, US M777s could come to a grinding halt in Ukraine. Kiev is running out of patience and the Pentagon is struggling to help. Mm -hmm. uh, M777 is an artillery gun that takes 155 millimeter artillery shells. Yeah. All right. While running out of its own inventory of the M795 155 millimeter shells, and Ukraine already having used possibly tens of thousands so far, yeah. the recent tactical victory at Kharkiv might just spur the U.S. to find a solution as President Zelensky portrays it as a first major turnaround in the six-month-long war. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Army on August 18th released a survey to find companies that can produce 12,155 millimeter artillery shells a month. This was, uh, they're looking for companies to do this. Yeah. What does that tell you? That they can't do it now. That they can't do it now. Okay. Because they don't have a company who manufactures it currently. Why That's don't why they have them already? Uh, well, well, because they depleted their own stockpile when it supplied 80,000 rounds to Ukraine as of early September. Yeah. So everything we had in this category, and this is just one category. Yeah. This is just one category of ammunition for these guns. Mm -hmm. Everything yeah. we had is gone already. We already sent it all to Ukraine. Yeah. A description of existing production capacity projected monthly production and delivery capability of 12,000 projectiles per month, maximum monthly production capacity and if they have made these uh, manufacturers have made this in the similar items in the past all right so if you look down here there's a good article we'll link this in the description Ukraine uses 5,000 of these a day but US wants to produce 500 and Russia can make 2,000 yep 
All right. Interestingly, Russia Critica Media itself notes Russia's sheer military industrial withdrawal could churn out 570,000 artillery ammunition as of 2017, which translates to 47,500 a month, almost 2,000 a day. That's four times what the U.S. aims to do. If they can get the manufacturing to do that in the United States. Yes. All right, this is one item here. Uh-huh. How much money has the U.S. spent on the Ukraine special military operation? How much? How much do you think? <clears throat> All right, this is an article from over a month ago. All right, August 11th. Okay, August 11th. I don't know. It's uh, reaching a trillion or something. Well, not quite there, but... Okay. When you add it all up, maybe. The U.S. has sent more than $54 billion to Ukraine since the war against Russia started. This is as of over a month ago. Uh-huh. Um, the aid package can be broken down into multiple types of aid. Um, $12.5 billion for weapons and supplies. nine point four for economic support. U.S. military deployments and intelligence, $9 billion. Food assistance, health care, and other aid, $7 billion. Military and security assistance, $6 billion, and the list goes on and on. How long do we think this is sustainable, that we provide this kind of resources to Ukraine? Um, it's not. As our economy flounders, as our energies are cut off, as we no longer are energy independent, well, uh, as the European Union yeah. and NATO countries collapse due to their loss of economic wherewithal. It's uh, not going to last long, really. I mean, also thanks to the current administration, you know, the resident of the White House, uh, we are not uh, energy independent anymore. We don't even, ex we don't export energy, right? So, uh, and we depend on Chinese manufacturing here and there in key positions, uh, which is not helpful at all. And now, uh, here's also the way I think about it. Well, uh, our strategic reserves of oil, which is, means our energy, and also our probably, I don't know if there is that same term applies to our munitions, etc., etc. Our strategic reserves of munitions, etc., are being depleted. Absolutely. What if someone just thinks, you know what, probably it's a very good time to try to harass our border, you know, somewhere. What are we going to shell them with? Right? <clears throat> Look at what's <clears throat> going on in our... Oh, since you're Armenian, you already know what's going on in Armenia right now. Of course uh, I do. I mean, people have... People, all right? Um, Azerbaijan has seen that Russia's preoccupied with Ukraine, yeah. so there's started some action up uh, an old rivalry rivalry with uh, their neighbor Armenia. Yeah. Um, in the Central Asian countries of um, Kyrgy Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan and, and Uzbekistan. Oh no, no. what was it? I'm Tajikistan. sorry. Tajikistan. Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are yeah. currently yeah. At odds also with some military action about, I don't even know what it's about. But, uh, they but don't, they yeah. didn't even define the border since the end of the USSR. Yeah, yeah. There, there is no border there. There's hundreds of miles of unmarked territory. Yeah, and they um, still didn't uh, resolve those disputes. So that's an, uh, an, an area of ongoing conflict. It just flared up once again. What's interesting to me is that to the backdrop of everything that's happening right now, yeah. To the backdrop of our oil reserves being depleted, to the backdrop of us sending all of these shells, um, how many millimeters? Don't remember. 155. 155 millimeters. 155 millimeters shells to Ukraine, and all of a sudden we're running out of this, and there's nobody to manufacture this. Does anybody remember the um, what I think is a deliberate, deliberately butchered withdrawal out of Afghanistan. Absolutely. So all yeah. of that, what was that, 80 billion worth of equipment? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. All of that landed in the hands of Taliban. Right. What's interesting, if, uh, if anybody looks at the map of that region, is yeah. that um, northern Afghanistan is bordered by Tajikistan. Right. So currently the action that's going on between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan kind of begs the question. I just wonder, just a an honest inquiry into the matter. Did any of that Taliban uh, stockpile of weapons show up anywhere on the Tajik-Kyrgyz uh, border? I'm just wondering. If you, wanna, if you want to learn something really interesting, look up this region as far as drug trade and the trade routes. Oh, yeah. And you might be able to understand the conflict there and what this um, 
the import of these weapons and military equipment being left to the Taliban has to do with any of that. Yeah. It's an interesting correlation. Yep, it's an interesting correlation. But to my point is that um, it's kind of absolutely ridiculous, bizarre, and dumb, I think, that we are, you know, uh, asking, looking for manufacturers for these artillery shells. At the same time, the same administration had absolutely no problem leaving behind stockpiles of military equipment. Um, and at the same time, allegedly, we're trying to quench uh, conflicts in, you know, Middle Asia, on the, in the Caucasus region, and allegedly uh, trying to win a war in Ukraine, helping the Zelensky regime. We can't even win the war on our own southern border. Yeah. I mean, it just, I nobody don't seems to care about that. Yeah, let's let's say let's put it this way. I don't see a path to victory here at all. Yeah. Because to me, right now, it's clear as day is that the Western countries, the NATO bloc, has depleted its resources and it is in in a very uh, weak position to support Ukraine. Um, if it goes on like this for another couple of months, a month maybe, I don't know. The NATO countries will be probably more will start to get more preoccupied with supporting themselves because they will start run into problems. I saw a post um, in an interview with the U.S. Uh, some representative from the U.S. military that was talking about supplying Ukraine with F-16 fighter jets in two to three years. In two to three, years. who's going to make them? Are we going to ship them our existing? pile of jets? Well, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Are we going to have anything for ourselves? Maybe they already have a fleet in Poland that they can fly over there. I don't know. I don't know. I we'll mean... Send them right next to the Soviet era T-72 tanks. Yeah. I, I start to think that probably the people who are making these decisions here in our country and generally speaking the staff of NATO, I think these people are mostly preoccupied with personal uh, power grabs of land, um, of resources, and right now, probably... And better, benefiting the military-industrial complex? Yes. By, uh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, so complex. I, yes. So by selling off all the old weapons to allow for new weapons to get manufactured. Yes. So Zelensky, If only we had the manufacturing capability, excuse me for interrupting, if we only had the, the manufacturing capability to make new weapons... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, these people, they, um, they need Zelensky to do his job. The job of Zelensky is to grab as much land as possible. Uh, and they want to have those resources, uh, and that includes people and natural resources, um, and they need that territory. And they are willing to go for whatever... Uh, whatever expenses it takes, you know, yeah. at the expense of uh, the people of the West, meaning both, you know, the American people and Europeans. Because th nobody seems to care really about, like in Swiss, in Switzerland, right? You remember, now it's uh, yeah. punishable, it's a, it's a crime to to use energy to you use a, uh, raise your thermostat above a certain temperature. Yes. You, you could be put in jail. Yes, yeah. obviously the powers that be in the West don't care for their own people. Right. And it's, I think it's only a matter of time before it leads to a really explosive situation. It's already very unstable in Europe. And I'm wondering how far are they going to push the envelope with these policies and with, with this stance. Um, I, don't th I think that maybe the initial uh, thing that they counted on, they thought that Russia would crumble. But what happened, catastrophically for the Western elites, is that Russia got thrown into a closer, uh, closer hug, you know, geopolitical embrace with China and India. Right. And these sanctions are backfiring at the NATO countries. They thought these sanctions would impose uh, some kind of economic hardship on mm -hmm. Russia. Yeah. And it seems like just the exact opposite has happened. Um, yep. Russia's economy is not doing that bad comparatively. I mean, Putin can sell his oil to whoever he wants. He doesn't have to sell it to NATO. He doesn't. He doesn't have to sell it to England. He doesn't have to sell it to Germany. Yeah. He can sell it to India. Yeah. He can sell it to Pakistan. He can sell yeah. it to China. 
And Russia, right now, Russian military-industrial complex, right? Think about all the jobs that this increased demand oh, for munitions Lord. creates, yeah. right? So more people are going to get employed, right? Absolutely. And that, by the way, sort of brings Russia back to the quote-unquote good old days of the USSR, <laughs> yes. right? right? Because right. now there are going right. to be more uh, government contractors, more factories working, more people employed and getting a steady paycheck. People are going to like it. Russia recently just got out of the USSR era. I mean, by historical measures, that's, that's recently, right. Right? right? So this is going to hit 30 us. years ago. Yeah. That's going hit, to hit the spot with a lot of Russians, right? Yeah. And that's only going to bolster Russia, not cripple it. I agree with that. Plus, on top of that, the added geopolitical benefit that uh, Russia has, you know, proximity with China and the already existing trade relations and routes that run through Central Asia, plus India on top of that, all of that geopolitical knot, that's going to bolster that, uh, that block. And if we look broader at this situation, it bolsters the BRIC countries. Ultimately. And, and imports a lot of trouble for the West. Yes. Um, and yeah. the, the most ridiculous part uh, in all of this is that this is self-inflicted. Oh, yeah. That the Western uh, liberal world order, you know, in the Western hemisphere, is doing it to itself. And all this could have been avoided through diplomacy, yeah. through soft power, through other means. But somehow... It didn't pan out for whatever reason. I don't know what for what reason, uh, but here we are. The same thing with respect to China and Taiwan. I mean, yeah. instead of just jumping on the, oh, we're going to defend Taiwan, how about negotiations? Have we tried negotiating with China and I mean, both saying, hey, Taiwan, hey, China, let's sit down and have a talk. And let's, yeah, and I let's mean... Let's have a beer and... Yeah. Watch the game and talk about this or something, yeah. anything. And this is regardless of, you know, um, any kind of moral any kind of moral aspect of the question. It doesn't matter. Are you on the side of Taiwan? Are you on the side of yeah. are you a communist? Are you a con are you a conservative? Are you a liberal? Are you a it doesn't matter. Right. Just from a purely practical standpoint. If you are on that level when you are determining foreign policy with other countries diplomacy is an art for a reason right you cannot just go and say things uh just like you would say that on tiktok for example you can't because that has consequences and those consequences are vast so that's not a way to go uh about you know foreign relationships that's a, an absolute i don't know how to call this this is way uh was that movie Dumb and Dumber? You know, Th that's it's kind of beyond awkward at this point. Yeah. It's beyond awkward. Yeah, and it's just it's going to invite more trouble for us. It is. It's stupid. Stupid on steroids. That's what it is. Uh, that's about all I have as far as articles. I think we ought to wrap it up. Um, we'll talk about Southern Caracal one more time. We'll put our logo up here. All natural skincare products. We got the finest oatmeal honey soaps you'll find anywhere. Body lotions, yeah, lip balm, aromatherapy soaps, CBD soaps, uh, shampoo bars. Yeah, shampoo bars. Check out our shampoo bars. Pick something for yourself. I mean, for real. Uh, Best thing to do is we're going to put our little uh, web address right here for you. There's a link down in the uh, description down below. Go to our website. Check it out. You may find some stuff you like. We have uh, some special Halloween soap boxes that Kat's been making. Real spooky yeah. little nice Halloween the boxes themselves make a Halloween decoration, all right? Yeah. We have a lot of gift ideas. The holidays are coming up, so check it out. We have gift sets available. Yeah, check out our website. Pick something for yourself or for your friends and family and your friends and family's skin and your own skin. We'll thank you later. I want to thank Catherine Corelli for being here, my co-host. Uh, check out her links down below. Also, she does some awesome music. Check out her YouTube channel, her Spotify link. Uh, give her a little support. Thank you very much. There's a link to my music if anybody wants to hear that stuff, too. <laughs> I'm thinking probably I should consider changing my last name to Kurelian, since I'm Armenian. Since now. you're Armenian since now. Since I'm is Armenian. Is that an Armenian headwear, by the way? Uh, no. It's rather no. kind okay. of... No. It's just kind of boho, I guess, bohemian. I like it. 
I don't Anyways, know. thanks for watching. Thanks for your support for Redneck TV with Cat. And Scott. We'll see you next time. Have a wonderful time of day. Good.